Okay, so um, let's consider another case. Let's say that we remove, let's say we start at equilibrium and we remove nitrogen. If we uh, remove nitrogen, well, let's forget about the table and just use Le Chatelet's principle. If we remove nitrogen, will that shift the reaction into forward or reverse using Le Chatelet? Reverse. Shift, reverse, because nature is going to try to add more nitrogen, which it does by doing the reverse. This is a little bit more complicated to think through, but if we get rid of nitrogen, nature tries to make more nitrogen, which happens in the reverse reaction. Notice that we got the same outcome in both cases. The net reaction will move in reverse. It will move in reverse if you add more product or if you remove starting material, because either way, nature can undo that by moving the reaction in reverse. Again, in terms of the table, What's happening here is we started in equilibrium. Now when we remove a starting material, that makes Q bigger again, because the starting materials are in the denominator. A, bigger, a smaller denominator means a bigger fraction. And then nature wants to move us back here by moving us into reverse again. So how can we encourage nature produce more ammonia. If we start at equilibrium, we're not going to be getting any more ammonia because we're in equilibrium. What could we do then? What disturbance could we impose that would make nature make more ammonia? Besides uh, remove ammonia? Let's try that. Okay. If you remove ammonia, which way will the reaction shift? So that worked. It'll shift forward and produce more ammonia. Of course, when you removed the ammonia, you hopefully stored it someplace, so you'll now have both the ammonia you removed and the new ammonia that was made in the reaction. So you've got more reaction, no more ammonia than when you started. So you're using Le Chatelet's principle there. What you did here is when you remove ammonia, you have less product. So what, would, what does that do to Q? Makes it smaller. So that would move us up here, and then nature tries to move us forward to get back to equilibrium. Now, there's one other thing we could do to get more ammonia besides removing ammonia. Remo uh, you take away both reactants, remove both species of reactants. So if we remove the nitrogen and the hydrogen, will the reaction shift forward or reverse? Reverse. Reaction will shift into reverse. Does that make sense that that would make the reaction shift yeah. into reverse? Is that what we want? No, so you no. would add more? Yeah. We could add nitrogen. If you add nitrogen, nature try you have now more starting material. And nature tries to undo that by using up starting material, which you can do by move shifting forward. So now we have two things on the board that we could do to produce more ammonia. We could remove ammonia or we could add nitrogen. What's the third thing that we could do? Add hydrogen. We could add hydrogen. That has the same effect as adding nitrogen. Again, you have more starting material and nature tries to undo that by moving forward to use up the starting material. to pressure. What about it? Does this change at all? Uh, when well, you... um, pressure and concentration are just two alternative, partial pressure and concentration are just two alternative ways of measuring okay. the amounts. So you, when you're so, removing ammonia, you're both reducing its partial pressure and reducing its concentration. So either of those um, would have the same effect. Right. Of course, if you added both of these together, then the reaction would shift even further forward. Or if we added these while removing ammonia, we would get even more ammonia. 
Now, these last two should have been pretty obvious even if you never heard of Le Chatelet's principle. It should be obvious that if you want more product, you can get more product by adding more starting material. Like, this should be obvious. The thing that's not obvious is that you can get more product by removing product. That coaxes nature to try to replace that. That's the non-obvious part of Le Chatelet's principle. Now, this is of great practical importance. Um, so, for example, this particular reaction is very important. Uh, this is the reaction for making ammonia, uh, which is very important in, say, fertilizer, mm -hmm. and also very important in uh, munitions, military, uh, explosives, and stuff like that. Now, so this is very important, say, if you're a fertilizer factory and you want to make a lot of ammonia. Now, does the factory want this reaction to go far forward? Yeah, they want to produce as much ammonia as possible. So it's a very practical question to ask, how can we make this go as far forward as possible? Um, because they pay for all this nitrogen and hydrogen, right? Well, they don't, want it to, they don't want to waste it. They want to use up as much of their starting materials as possible to get as much product as possible. So the industrial chemists that are involved, employed by the firm, it's their job to make this go as far forward as possible. So what can they do while the reaction is going to coax it to go far forward? Yeah, although that's kind of obvious. What else can they do? Constantly Yeah, that's right. The non-obvious thing is that it's the chemist's job to constantly remove the product as it's created. That way, we won't have very much unreacted starting materials. We're constantly using Le Chatelet's principle to coax the reaction to go further and further forward. So Le Chatelet's principle has very important practical concentrations for industrial chemistry if you want to get the reaction to go as far forward as possible. Okay, that's just one application. I use the example of this fertilizer, this ammonia example, but this would be true uh, of anything that you're trying to produce. Anything that a firm is, any chemical reaction a firm is trying to carry out, they probably want it to go as far forward as possible. And they can use the Chatelet's principle to try to encourage that. All right, so one more time. If we add ammonia, which way will this reaction shift? Reverse. Right. We've added more product, so we're going to try to remove that product. All right, now remember that we actually gave a little proof for Le Chatelet's principle. We showed that if you add a con if you change a concentration, that disturbs Q, and then Q tries to get back to where it started, where, uh, at K. Um, what that also tells us, though, is Le Chatelet's principle does not apply to changes in the concentration of pure liquids and pure solids. Le Chatelet's principle does not apply if you change the concentration of a pure solid or a pure liquid. Why would that be? Yeah, changing the liquids and the solids doesn't affect Q. In fact, remember that since Q has nothing to do with the liquids and solids, the amount of liquid and solid doesn't determine whether you're at equilibrium or not. Whether you're at equilibrium is determined by the amount of aqueous and gaseous species, not liquids and solids, because they don't affect Q or K. Um, so changing liquids and solids can't disturb us from equilibrium. So the Chandelier's principle is not 100% applicable. It only applies so when does it apply? It only applies to changes in concentrations of aqueous and gaseous species. And remember, I mentioned a couple times, it applies if you've started in equilibrium. It generally assumed when you're, uh, the disturbance is starting, starting from equilibrium. That's how we always did the examples in the table, starting in the middle row and then moving to a different row. So if we're out of equilibrium, Le Chatelet's principle doesn't apply there. All right, now let's say that we start in equilibrium and we add argon gas. I'm using argon because this is an inert, noble gas, very unreactive. So it's not going to participate in this reaction or react with these other species. Now the key thing is, if you add argon, remember that what matters here is the partial pressures of each of these gases. Well, adding argon will increase the total pressure because now there'll be pressure from the argon, but it won't change the partial pressures from each of the individual gases. The partial pressure of the nitrogen just depends on how much nitrogen there is, and the partial pressure of the hydrogen just depends on how much hydrogen there is. At least, uh, uh, at least, uh, yeah, at least that's true for an ideal gas, which is what we're basically focusing on here. So changing the amount of argon will not change the partial pressures of these reactants. So when we add argon, should that shift us forward, shift us reverse, or have no effect? No effect. No effect. No effect. This is actually tested fairly frequently. So adding an inert gas has no effect because it doesn't change the partial pressures of the, uh, the gases that are participating in the reaction. Do you, uh, do you think they'll say like, that it's inert, or are we supposed to know? They might say it, but you are expected to know that if they're using a noble gas, that that's inert. Yeah. Remember, the noble gases are the ones from the last column of the periodic table, like neon and argon. 
or helium.